Okay, so I'm Kim Godwin. I'm an instructional designer with MTSU Online. And uh, with us today are Tara Parent and Karen Hine, who are the other instructional designers with MTSU Online. And they will be monitoring the chat. Um, and just so y'all know, the reason that we do that is because I get distracted. Um, so <laughs> it really, really helps to have other people uh, monitoring your chat. So if you can ever figure out a way to do that in a presentation, I vote for it because they're awesome. Uh, and I really appreciate all that they have done to support me over the last year in these presentations. Um, that by the way, because I had to do digital measures too, it was 15 presentations for the LT and ITC in this academic year. So um, I hope they have been helpful for y'all. Uh, and we are already in conversations about ones that we will be doing next year, um, including one on cognitive load theory and probably a couple of others. So if y'all have any suggestions over the next few weeks and months, please get those to Sheila so that we can start making plans for what we're going to be doing next year. Um, so on that, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started talking about alignment of student learning outcomes. So I am going to share my screen and we'll get going. Okay, so here we are. Yay. All right, so our topic today is why do I have to do this? Aligning student learning outcomes to activities and assessments. And I thought about the, the title and the topic title um, and it really is directed at our students and ourselves. Um, why are we adding things to our courses? Uh, and have you ever had a student ask why they have to do something in your course? And a lot of what we'll talk about during this presentation deals with addressing that before it ever really even happens and thinking about how we are best meeting the needs of our students as well as the needs of our course um, and our course connecting to other courses. Uh, so during this workshop, we're going to talk about goals, objectives, and outcomes and how those are different in a course. Um, we're going to talk about essential priorities for a, a course, a unit, or a module. We're going to talk about activities and consider activities and assessments in your course and what you are measuring. And then we are going to feel confident about composing student learning outcomes that align with activities and assessments in our course. I always try to add one that at the end of it, we're like, yes, I get this. Um, so that is my uh, celebration one for us. We're gonna feel good about life at the end of this. Uh, so determining priorities is really where I wanna start. Uh, and that kind of goes back a little bit to what I mentioned about the cognitive load theory and looking at that. For those of you that were in the presentation two weeks ago, we talked about cognitive load and determining the load that our students can absorb uh, and how much information we're putting in a course. Um, and we talked about that in terms of instruction hours, but it really flows into um, creating and aligning our student learning outcomes. Uh, so we will briefly touch on that here. And then again, um, Sheila and I have already talked about in the fall doing one on cognitive load theory so that you all can really think about that and what that is and what that measures. So part of the concept of thinking about our, our priorities and what are our priorities and, and how we determine what's most important for our students to, to learn and then by process us measure in our course is we really need to think about beginning with the end in mind. So um, Kevin Crambule does a presentation um, and I think it's on the Stay On Course page about um, backward design. So it's really kind of a concept around that um, and thinking about where we want to be at the end of the course and how do we get there um, and what are we doing to scaffold our information and create those steps along the way to get our students there. Well, to know that we need to know what our ultimate goal is. What is that final thing that we want to get in our course? Um, so it's kind of a flipped mindset from the way some of us may think about things in general or um, think about our courses um, instead of just starting at the beginning and trying to cover everything and hoping that time doesn't run out because uh, time always runs out, whether it's because we have a global pandemic or we have a week of snow or um, our students struggle with a concept and we kind of got to back it up just a little bit and revisit some of those things. 
uh, at least in my classes, if I didn't think about where I wanted to end, I'd get stuck somewhere in the middle. Sometimes it's because I get excited about a topic and I lose track of how long it's taking me to get past it. Um, I'm sure that doesn't happen to anybody else, um, but that happens to me. If I'm super excited about a topic, I can get way off track and then all of a sudden be like, oops, we never got there. Um, so really thinking about where I want to get in the end keeps me focused and it helps my students keep that path as well. Um, so what are the most important topics to know? So if we're thinking about um, a course or we're thinking about a course in general um, and we're looking at things and, and we're saying, okay, this is an okay, introduction to photography class. Um, at the end of an introduction to photography class, do we need to know everything that ever happened in terms of creating black and white and color and um, using filters and all kinds of different things? Probably not everything that ever happened in our intro class. Um, but what do we need to know at the end of that in order to be able to go on to the next class? So really thinking about what those key components are. And we're going to talk about that on the next one, but that should be the things that are your course learning objectives. Um, so you might want to kind of revisit and think about that, whether or not those are actually measuring those things. So what are those key takeaways that I want my students to get out of this course? When they leave here, what are those four or five things that if they know these things, they're going to be successful moving to the next, on to the next and on to the next, um, whether that be a 2000 level class, a 4000 level class, graduation, a job, graduate school, whatever it is that they're headed towards. What are those four or five things that from this course, if they know these things, I feel like I have accomplished those things. Uh, think about your desired results. Uh, determine your acceptable evidence. And that is where we start getting into activities and assessments. How are we determining that our students know these things? How are we determining that when they leave, they actually understand this concept and they can apply it and they can analyze it and they can create new things as a result of the information that they've gained in our course. And then we need to plan our learning experiences around how we are getting to that acceptable evidence. So if we plan our learning first, are we actually thinking about our evidence? If we're thinking about our evidence and how we know they're gonna learn, then that in itself aligns us with our activities. And we have in that one moment created this activity directly relates to the thing that I want you to learn. When you leave this course, you're going to know how to do this thing. And this is how we got there. So that is the very direct line of um, alignment of outcomes. So great. I hope you all enjoyed our presentation. Have a great day. I'm just kidding. Um, we have a lot more to cover, but that is the gist of it all um, is really thinking about the activities and the assessments and the things that we're having them do in our courses and the things that we're focusing on in terms of learning activities, resources, uh, the different assessments that they do are those getting where we want to go in terms of measurement of those four or five things that we said are the most important. So let's look at goals, objectives, and outcomes. I mentioned a minute ago that those four or five things should be your course objectives. Um, so we'll see. So what is a student learning outcome? So a student learning outcome actually is a unit or module level verb based measurement sentence. Not the best English, so Sheila's probably loving that sentence. Um, but that's basically what it is. It is taking an action verb and putting it in place and putting it on your unit or your module. It is not necessarily something that um, directly is the course objective. Like it's not taking that level and putting that in every single uh, module or unit of your course it is what is specifically happening in that module, that unit, um, that if you like to use week, week, that week of your course, what is happening that week? What are you measuring that week? What are they learning this week? Uh, and how are these different from goals and objectives? So goals and objectives, Goals typically come from our uh, typically an accrediting body or departmental goals or program goals. Um, course level objectives, those come from um, our syllabi, from curriculum mapping that was done when the degree program was first put in place. Um, these are the ones that um, were approved by your faculty. Um, 
by um, our university curriculum committee or the graduate committee, um, you know, who approved those and got those in place. So course learning objectives um, are often vague in nature um, and they're not always measurable. And I always add this little, that that is an issue for another day. Um, hopefully we'll actually get to that day, but your, your actual course learning objectives should also be measurable. They're just a bigger concept of measurable, um, as should your goals from your accrediting body. But I, that is a way bigger issue um, than we can address here in this one LT and ITC presentation. Um, so thinking about those in terms of what, what do I mean by vague? So it's large concepts. It's things like students will be able to critically think, what, what is that? What is that? But how do we measure if a student can critically think? How do we get there? I mean, we may know if you're thinking about that right now, how do you know that your students are critically thinking about something in your course? I'll give you a second to process that. We know they're thinking about things. We know that that information, or at least we hope that they're thinking about things. And we know that that information is there for them to begin processing. But by critically thinking, that's where we're looking at things like synthesis, um, application, creation, evaluation, when we're using those measurable verbs to get to student being able to critically think. And that's where they're showing you that they're doing it. Um, so, and that's where it, it gets into the, how they're connected down that path. Um, and the, you know, I said they should be able to critically think. And then I said, it's about evaluation or synthesis or things like that. It's very specific to the activities and assessments that they're doing in that module uh, and how we determine what those are and then connecting them back up the path and back down the path. Um, I like to think of it in terms of the pyramid and inverted pyramid. Your goals are huge and then you have your objectives and then you have your outcomes. And then I actually go this back this direction and I think about my assessments and my activities and my resources. So for me, it's like a little hourglass. It's like, oh, we started here with our goals and then we have some objectives and then some outcomes. And then what are those assessments that measure those outcomes and what are those activities that led to that assessment? And then what are those resources that led to those activities that led to that assessment, that led to that outcome, that led to that objective, that led to that goal? Um, so thinking about that and it's okay um, and this is one of those ones that sometimes people tell me it's not okay, but it's okay, especially when you're um, really thinking about your course and laying out your content and your activities. If that flows a little bit back and forth, um, if you have a great idea for an assessment, um, it's okay if you come up with that assessment and then find the right activities and resources to match it. It's also okay if you come up with this amazing resource or activity and then move some things around to make it work with a particular assessment. Or if in your student learning outcome, you change your verb after you've thought about it for a while and you're like, that assessment that I've come up with, the verb I initially said may not quite match that. It's okay to change your verb in your student learning outcome because that doesn't have to go through the curriculum committee. Yes, Trey. I can't hear you. You're muted. You're muted. Or or you're on the wrong microphone. <laughs> I bet it's a great question, see. Uh, or he's telling me that it's not okay to me, go back and forth. <laughs> am I am I on? Hey, there you are. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yes. It switched God it switches mics whenever I log out of a meeting. <laughs> So I have a question about uh, this objectives versus outcomes, mm -hmm. and this literally could be semantics and it could just be the, and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll put my cards on the table. In my view, the language about outcomes is just kind of the flavor of the month. In, in my view, I've, as a, as a long time course developer, I have written measurable learning objectives that use the right verb within Bloom's taxonomy and so forth, that literally say the learner will be able to list or describe, you know, not the learner will understand or will right. you know, pretty, you know, have really specific um, learning objectives. So I, I see some of this literature about outcomes and I think that's just 
a measurable learning objective. And then I see the word outcome and I'm thinking in my mind, you can't, like we can't use the word outcome because it hasn't come out yet. You know what I mean? In other words, outcome means what happened as a result of the course. You know, I taught a course and these were the outcomes. Like I can't know an outcome until it comes out. So it's that may be just a semantic thing, but I, I don't see the, the, the clear distinction between real well-written measurable learning objectives with good blooms verbs compared to a, a student learning outcome. Great. Yes, I think some of it is semantics. For me, where it makes sense to me is because my outcomes are tied to a unit and not a course. I mm -hmm. am actually measuring it per uh, module or unit, not per course. Mm -hmm. So in my mind on that, at the end of this one unit, you should be able to do this one or two things. Okay. Um, it, it's harder, I think, with the overall course objective and and really honestly depending on what path of um, curriculum development or instructional design you took you may flip outcome and objective um i think it really just depends it and this is horrible and education y'all know likes to do stuff like this it really does just depend on how you're using it um and how you justify which one that you're using at least to me um, i get that part I, in your mind and you're consistent in your own mind and you can explain it to someone else, I think it's okay. Has anybody ever asked you about the use of the word outcome? Like you're saying, oh, in my course, I've listed my student learning outcomes. Does anybody ever say, how do you know? You know, how do you know that's what came out? You haven't taught the course yet. I'm just, I'm just I have a, an issue with that word, outcomes. It's like, <laughs> we, we built this factory to make these Model T Ford cars and there's the outcome. It's all those cars we produced, you know, as opposed to saying before, well, we haven't run the factory yet and here are the outcomes. Well, and I'll jump in real quick and just say from what I've been in the literature as of late, because we can't guarantee that outcomes can be measured, that's why they're changing the literature. So instead of saying the student will be able to, saying the student should be able to, because even though we're asking them to do all these things, we can't guarantee Right, without, I mean, we're just people. We can't guarantee without a doubt that they can do it. So I think that directly plays into the use of the word outcome, since it seems in the literature they flip objective and outcome pretty often or use it interchangeably, even when maybe they shouldn't. <laughs> but that's just my thoughts on that. <laughs> Please carry on. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know that I actually answered it, but it's a great discussion. <laughs> Uh, okay, so back to where we were. Um, why is slow alignment so important? Um, and this goes back to the, have students ever asked you why they need to know something? Um, is there a point to this assignment? When will I ever use this in real life? Why do we have so much busy work? Um, if you are upfront and honest uh, with your students about the information and about the activities and about the assessments, and what it is that you are, are wanting to have happen, you get fewer of these questions. Um, I don't know about y'all, but personally, when I have someone ask me what the point of something is, um, I tend to be like, well, I would not make you do something that did not have purpose and value. But if I'm not telling them that purpose and value, that's where I've missed. It's not that my activity or my assessment isn't getting to there, it's that they don't know why it matters. So I need to make sure that I'm much more clear about its purpose. And by making these outcomes and making them obvious and stating them and making them very available, that really does help. Um, and yeah, I, most of the courses I teach, I teach online and most of the courses that I help people develop, I teach online. So there's that really cute description area that you can put at the top of a, a module page where you can actually put your student learning outcomes and that also helps you when you're creating your activities and resources and content for that module you are constantly looking back at that you are constantly thinking about what is it that i'm going to do today and in live face-to-face -face classes or even live synchronous classes um, that we're using zoom or, or whatever other technologies we do tend to at the very beginning of a class say this is what we're going to talk about today and this is what we're going to do today so we have in essence told them what those are 
the concept with this is about being specific and assigning those outcomes or objectives ahead of time um, to make sure that you know and that you're staying on track with what it is that you're going to talk to talk to them about that day. Um, so when we're thinking about all of those things um, and thinking about that outcome and assignment and assessment and alignment and all of those things, most of us have some sort of accrediting group. I mean, we all fall under SACS, um, but a lot of us have one that's very specific to our field or our program or our major, our department, um, any of those things that are some very specific objectives and outcomes and goals that they have given you that you have to align. If you are thinking about what those are at the program level, and then you're thinking about what they are at the course level, and then you're thinking about what they are at the unit level, and you're actually putting things in place that are measuring that from minute one, when it comes time for reaccreditation, you actually can say, we met this because we did this thing. So it actually makes it easier for you down the road if you're getting ready for something like that, because you have consciously thought about how those goals and objectives and outcomes line up with every single course and every single activity that you do. Um, so it does take a little bit of time to think about that, but especially if you are in the process of uh, creating a new course or really redeveloping a course that you've had for a while, whether that's face-to-face -face or online, uh, it really gives you that chance to think about those overall goals and making sure that you really do have that alignment from top to bottom and back up um, and helps you with that. So this is one of my favorite examples. And those of you that have had presentations with me, you will probably have seen this before because I use it a lot. Um, so I'm just not creative enough, I guess, to come up with other examples. But I feel like most of us at some point in our life had to take a statistics or research course um, for us to be where we are in higher education. Um, so we all have had a little bit of validity and reliability in our lives. And some of us might actually be having a physical reaction to those words being on the page terribly sorry about that. Um, so for me, when I think about this um, and I think about validity and reliability, I think about what it is that I want my students to be able to do with these concepts at the end of our uh, module or unit that we use to talk about validity and reliability. So my outcome is the students should be able to apply a test and defend the selection for a research study. The activity that I am putting with this is that I am reviewing resources, describing the types of tests available as well as how and why each is applied. And now this is when I give you a couple of assessment op options and how to think about those different assessments. And this is where I'm really talking about alignment. So with possible assessment one, submit a written explanation of all common tests utilizing course and outside resources. So they're giving me a definition of the different types of tests. The second one, analyze one of the research plans provided. So imagine that I have given you research plans and submit your selection and justification for the test or test you choose utilizing course and outside resources to defend your position. Which one of those fits my outcome? If my outcome is that they should be able to apply a test and defend their selection is writing the definition matching my outcome or is analyze one and then provide justification. So when I talk about making sure that our outcomes match our actual activities and aligning our activities and assessments, I literally mean thinking about the verb that we used and whether or not our assessment is actually measuring that verb. Um, are we putting in place the opportunity for our students to do the thing that we said we wanted them to be able to do? Uh, for me, with these concepts, I think it's, it's important for students to have an idea of what validity and reliability are and know where to go find those resources, not so much memorize all the different tests. Um, most of us, unless you, you teach this regularly or you um, are always doing different types of research that require these, you may not remember every single one of those tests exactly as they are, but I bet you know where to go find them and I know you know how to apply them. So what you should think about is how in your courses you're using those verbs and aligning that activity. 
Does anybody have any questions about that before we go to the next thing? Okay. All right, so measurable action. I have said it, I think probably a million times at this point, if somebody was keeping a tally, I'm losing. Um, your slows are measurable, actual measurable verbs. Um, Trey earlier mentioned understand. That is not a measurable verb. I'm just putting that out there. It's not, you cannot measure that. Um, so just if you have some that say understand, I want to encourage you to revisit that over the next few weeks or months and try to replace understand uh, in your outcomes and objectives if you can. Um, it's based on an action verb. Um, so for example, a verb, the verb is the assessment. So if a student learning outcome states, the student will be able to compare and contrast, but your assessment is a multiple choice quiz. Is that the right verb choice for the assessment that we've put in place? Um, instead of a multiple choice quiz, should be we using some sort of activity where they actually do compare and contrast? Or do we need to change our compare and contrast? Um, and that's where I say it's okay to look at those things and it's okay to revisit those um, as long as they're not the ones that were approved by your curriculum committee. Um, but it's okay to revisit and make sure you are actually matching and change things as you need to from semester to semester. Don't change them in the middle of the semester um, if you're an approved online course that they've already stated. Um, but it's okay to change as you're planning and developing your content. And Kim, I've also seen uh, these written like the the student will learn about the three houses of government, you know, or something like that. And like, yeah. no, that's what the instructor is going to do, not what the student's going to do. Right. Right. That's always one of my favorite. They will understand and they will learn. Thanks. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about where we find these verbs. Um, so a lot of people have heard of Bloom because Bloom has been around for a whole long time. Um, and Bloom's taxonomy has been through a couple of different revisions um, and things have occurred with it. Um, so uh, we have, I'll show you all this resource. Um, hopefully it'll just pop right up. Um, so here is one of the resources that we provide. Um, if anybody needs it, I'm trying to make it big enough for you to see it because I know my screen is crazy. Um, but here's one of the resources that actually talks about digital. Do what? I just let letting everyone know that that is actually in the chat if you want to open the file. Oh, thank you. Um, um if you want to open that up and it can y'all hear me? Because it is telling me that I am muted. Okay, technology. <laughs> Um, so uh, feel free to open that up and take a look at it. It's just an example of verbs. This one is digital and that it kind of adds some stuff that even a few years ago might not have made a verbs list. Things like um, podcasting or wiki building um, or things like that that might be a little different than they were when Bloom first wrote his first level of taxonomy because, well, the computer wasn't around yet. So. Um, just take a look at that in terms of, of interesting verbs. It also can sometimes help you when you're looking at those verbs, thinking about activities that you might want to do. Sometimes when I see these verbs, I'm like, ooh, I wonder if I could figure out a way to do an assessment with that cool verb. Um, and one of the other things to think about in terms of, of blooms or really any um, taxonomy verb list that's out there is your levels of verbs. If you are in a graduate course, like a 6,000 or 7,000 level course, I'm not sure that we need to focus a whole lot on the remembering category. Um, they, they should know this stuff. And you, in essence, are measuring the lower order thinkings, which is what the lots are. You're measuring those when you're looking at the ones that are the higher order thinkings. You can't really evaluate something if at some previous point you didn't already understand it. Um, so it's, it's almost assumed when you start doing those higher orders. In that same boat, first semester freshman, um, 18 years old, straight up out of high school, maybe don't start with creating, might want to do some remembering and understanding 
levels before we get all the way to evaluating and creating to make sure that we have laid that base foundation uh, and that they have that information that they can then later apply. All right, so the next one I wanted to mention just a little bit is one of my favorites. Um, I am a, a big think person, defink. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance to look into think, I would encourage you to take some time to go look at that at some point. Um, but it's about creating significant learning. Uh, and he uses different verbs uh, in, in his list and how we get there. And one of the the concepts about um, his, and I think Tara just put this one in the chat too, uh, is that he does it in a slightly different way uh, and how, how he thinks about those things. And this makes sense um, in my brain. Um, so I'm aware that it may not make sense in anyone else in the whole world's brain, but it makes sense in mine. Uh, and how it connects to our different dimensions and how it connects to different ways of thinking and knowing and creating those opportunities for um, significant learning and taking students to that next level of application and creation. Um, you know, this, these really work amazing when you're thinking about um, authentic assessments and experiential learning. These are going to work really, really well um, in those and how students are applying that to things that they're going to keep doing outside of of college. Um, so foundational knowledge is uh, when you're thinking back on Bloom's, he had remembering and understanding as the first two that is lumped together as foundational knowledge. Then we have application, integration. And then these are the ones that I actually am drawn to the most is when we start getting down into the human dimension and the caring and um, the learning how to learn. So remember earlier when I talked about critical thinking and how do we know if they're critical, if there's critical thinking going on? For me, when we get up into the learning how to learn um, and the carings and the human dimension, that's where I start to really see some of that critical thinking is when I get into those later concepts of really connecting to the learner and the learner connecting the information to what it is that's going on in their life or in their class or in their future career. Um, and this, I, I really do encourage y'all at some point to go back and look at this because it's got some really great information and there's a lot of resources just on the internet about DFINK. Um, but there are also, once you scroll down just a little bit, um, there is another list of action verbs that we give you um, that are connected to each of those dimensions. Um, so, no oh, critical thinking, look at that. Um, critical thinking, practical thinking, um, all of those ones that are listed above, it actually gives you some, some great verbs to think about. Um, and one of the ones I really actually wanted to show y'all is, um, it's right down in here, maybe it was back over here. It's when I said I like for us to feel good about things and I, I added the one about um, we feel confident about um, that is actually one of the ones that comes from this list of verbs. So I added that to our presentation because I actually wanted to show you what that means um, and where that applies within creating those action verbs and not feeling limited by um, the same ones we see over and over again. You know, you see a lot of demonstrate, um, describe, things like that really feel like you can get out there and use some additional verbs and and information to create some of those student learning outcomes. Um, you know, if you're if you're in a conflict resolution class, I feel like resolve conflict would be a great word verb choice um, for some point in your class um, or maybe negotiate or motivate um, as opposed to identify. Um, so really helping students take it to that next level in terms of, of verbs and what those verbs can take us to uh, and not limiting ourselves and helping them see that connection. Does, any, does anybody have any questions about blooms or significant learning before we go to our activity? Because I just showed you we're going to have an activity. Okay. So activity and practice, I, these are a couple of the resources I told y'all at the beginning, we were going to give y'all some resources and this is one of them. Um, we, uh, I think Tara probably already put it in the chat or is about to, um, but it is a word document and please feel free to edit, change, 
uh, do whatever you need to make it fit you and what you believe and feel. Um, we're, we're very big on sharing open educational resources. So really what this is, is an activities table. Um, and the reason that it's here is what, what we encourage um, for you to do when you're thinking about uh, developing course content or you're thinking about reviewing your course content uh, or thinking about how you're gonna re realign some activities and assessments in your class. Think about your course learning objective. Consciously think about your verb level. Consciously think about it. Look at this and think, I have five that are in remembering and I'm a 4,000 level class. I might need to branch it up into the next level um, and really think about the higher order thinking and, and am I creating those opportunities for them to create um, or the human dimension or caring dimension? Am I getting to those higher levels or am I staying very basic? Um, and ba there's nothing wrong with the basics, especially in a, uh, an early level course, an intro course, or you know the beginning of a graduate course when you're having uh, people didn't have to come through a certain path to get into your graduate program and you may need to do some some remembering and some reviewing to get them up to that level, that's totally fine. Just think about it. Um, there's nothing wrong one way or the other, just want you to think about it. And then start creating your outcomes that you think would help you get to that course objective. Start thinking about what it is that are the things that make the most sense in order to get you to that objective. Where does your brain go? How does your student show you based on that, um, that alignment that we talked about under the at the very beginning with backward design and determining our priorities, what are those things that we want them to be able to show us they know or should know how to do at the end of this unit or module or course? And then start thinking about those activities and assessments. Um, and again, this is another one that it's okay for you to kind of go back and forth between these boxes and and think about which ones fit best and which ways you want to make that work. Um, it's it's for you to use. Um, so you can cut and paste and scratch things out and delete things and add new things all that you want to. Um, but we will send you this. So it's something that you can definitely make practice of that alignment within that. Does anybody have questions about this resource? Okay, and then this one. So this one is, um, this is a, one of the ones that we use in MTSU Online uh, when we are working with a, a developer to uh, either newly develop a course or redevelop a course, either way. Um, it is a way to go with the philosophy uh, that we adhere to that you should create your course content outside of D2L um, and focus on your resources and creating your activities and creating your assessments and really thinking about the information without feeling um, inhibited by what you know that you can do in D2L. Um, there are some things that, that you may not know that D2L can do and they like to send out updates. So there's things every day that D2L may not have done last week that it now does. Um, so some of those are great and some of those maybe less so, but um, if you're thinking about a course, either face-to-face -face or online, um, if you think about your whole course and you think about it outside of your class, it really, it really can help you think more creatively. Uh, and that's really what a lot of this is about. And my guess is, is that you do this a little bit before you go into a course, whether that's face-to-face -face or a synchronous online course that you think about everything that you're gonna cover that day and you think about everything that you're gonna talk about and where you want your students to go. And you think about this stuff when you're developing your syllabus and when you're thinking about your activities and where they're gonna fall on an assignment schedule or calendar, you're already thinking about these things, but doing it outside of D2L or doing it outside of the confines of a syllabus kind of creates an opportunity for you to be really creative about things and think about things in the, a much bigger scope. Um, and for me, um, I keep ones like this kind of going on the side. Um, and when I'm randomly doing something else, 
if an idea pops in my mind for an assessment or I find a resource that's super cool um, or something like that, I actually feel like it's a place that I can go and drop that resource and add some notes about it so that six months later, I'm not trying to be like, where was that thing that I found and where did I hide it? And is that post-it note still on my desk? Um, this gives me an opportunity to really keep that over there. So this is actually something that I encourage to keep as just a working document. Uh, so let me, I'm gonna show that to y'all now. Um, and it is, so this is all it is. It really is just um, a Word document that helps you structure your course and think about every component of it. Um, so it walks you through all the things that you wanna think about in terms of, of development. But one of the things I wanna point out is you will see um, in the very beginning, all modules will include an overview and a welcome. Your student learning outcomes really thinking about what those are, the order of what you want to complete, your readings and media, your activities and assessments, and then your module summary and next steps. So if you think about all of those things in every single unit and every single module, you are on your own creating that alignment of your student learning outcomes to your activities and assessments and your objectives. You have created that path because you're consciously thinking about it with every step along the way. Um, and here is the part that that I, I find most benefit in is here under the readings and media and then further down under the activities and assessments. This is where when I find a resource or I find something that I think is really cool, I will put it in here. Um, and then I actually add the focus or purpose. Um, I actually make a note to myself as to why this is meaningful. Why do I think this was important enough to put it in here? So if you remember back to the very, very beginning when I talked about why do we have to do this? If you are answering that question in the very beginning, as you are thinking about the resources that you're adding, as you're thinking about the activities that you're creating, if you're thinking about your why in the very beginning, you are already answering that question for your students and you're already answering that question for yourself. You are creating that opportunity for them to feel connected to the resources, to the activities, to the assessments. Um, I think Tara probably already shared this with you. So uh, if y'all would like to have an earworm, please feel free to click on that YouTube channel um, and you get to hear a quality 80s tune that will stick with you probably all day. Um, but that was just to provide you a couple of examples. Don't feel like you have to do that, but there's also um, a pretty neat resource in there from University of California. Um, about alignment um, and it's got some resources in it that I think y'all might like as well. Um, but we also add some other things for you to think about articles, case studies, policies, websites, textbooks, TED Talks, YouTubes, anything that you can think of. Don't feel limited by, by resources that you already know. Take that opportunity to really go out there and see if you can find the resource that best connects to what it is that you want your student to walk away from this course knowing. What is it that you want them to learn? What is it that you want them to be able to do or process or create as a result of being in your course? Think about that and all of those concepts. Does anybody have questions about this one? Okay. Oh, hey, don't say. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. That is the gist of the presentation. So what kind of questions do y'all have? What kind of things can I answer for you? Uh, and I'm going to turn off my screen share here in just a second. Um, but what kind of questions do you have about alignment? Did this spark anything for you? Are you right now in one of the courses that you're thinking about kind of in that moment of thinking about an assessment and how do we come up with an awesome verb? We could, as a group, think about what that verb is and how we might create that opportunity with you. So please feel free to share or ask any questions that you have about anything. I have a question, Kim. You know, I, some of the some of the words that, that you like module and things like that, I don't know exactly sort of what they mean. But, you know, I guess for in, in the photography classes that I teach, when I give the students a project uh, to work on, um, I give them a project sheet that lists out all the requirements, everything to think about, some things to look at. 
And what I started doing is at the very top of that project sheet, discussing some of the very specific outcome, not maybe not outcomes, but uh, some of the things that I'm wanting them to be able to do by the time they're done with this project. Is that is that what you're kind of talking about with that last document is saying that, you know, when you're working on this module, this is specifically from the, the, the bulk that I listed at this on the syllabus. These are the things that this particular project or module is, is looking at? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. And modular unit is really just the, um, when you're looking at the online, they're, they're called modules. Um, so that's module unit. Some people call it week. I don't call it week, um, but some people call it week. Um, so yeah, that's all it is. Um, but it can apply to a module, a unit, a product, a project, a week, uh, anything, as long as whatever it is that you're thinking about how those activities are specifically connecting to what it is you said the students needed to learn at the end of the course, then that's exactly what it's about. Questions? I have a quick question. Sure. So I sometimes have assignments that really, to be honest, don't directly get to one of my learning outcomes. So for example, I might want them to take a brief quiz or write a quick summary on a chapter they're supposed to read, because if I don't, they may not read it. And if they come to class without having read that, they won't know what I'm talking about. So, you know, sometimes I have these little checks to make sure that they're doing what I've asked them to do. But I, I do think it can come across as just kind of busy work. So do you have any advice of how, how to explain that without saying, I'm really just checking up on you? <laughs> I mean, sometimes we have to do a little bit of that anyway. <laughs> um, so even with that, I think that as long as you're upfront and honest about why you do it, that, and especially if they can, if they are doing well with it in the beginning, um, limit them as this semester goes along. Or if they are doing really badly with it, it's okay to add one or two and be like, listen, <laughs> This was what we needed to be talking about this in order to get to this place and get this information, there needs to be some underlying foundation and how are we going to get there and how are we going to get that information. So, um, I, yeah, I, I don't know that I necessarily answered your question, but I think as long as you're honest with them about why those exist, uh, if they do a better job of doing what they're supposed to do, then some of those things might go away, um, that that might help a little bit with that. Anybody else have any suggestions on that? Thanks, Tiffany. I will say that one of the problems that I have overall with students not understanding why I have a certain assignment is they don't think they should have to take my class because it's a gen ed class it's history surveys. They think it's completely worthless. It's a waste of their time. It's a box they have to check. So anything in that aim, and if they take it online, even pre-pandemic, they didn't think it was a, a real class because it's stupid. So there's really not much I can do with those students because I'm never gonna, that's not true. I have had a couple that have come back and said, I used to hate history. I didn't realize it was so interesting. Or, wow, that explains why X happened. Yes, that does. So, yay, we achieved a learning objective. <laughs> but, but it's really frustrating when you're doing gen eds. And, and I have to say, as a, you know, I ended up as a history major, I resented taking math classes. Mm -hmm. I hated math. I despised math. But I understood math was important so I could balance my checkbook. I didn't do it well, but I did attempt to balance my checkbook. So I didn't actually acknowledge that the subject had merit and worth, but in the liberal arts, it's really, really hard to convince students to buy into the validity, the validity of your subject matter sometimes. Yes, uh, and I, I, I see it too with, um, with things like history. I, 
I mean, I, I know I've told y'all several times that my undergrad is in history. Um, so I very much had that opinion of a lot of survey classes myself, um, that it was just a lot of information and, and wasn't really sparking for me. Um, and some of the things that I've actually seen with that is, is giving the students just a little bit more ownership and making those connections on their own and thinking about those things in terms of um, like in Fink's list, thinking about those things in the learning how to learn and the caring and the human dimension and consciously helping them see how it connects to their daily life. Now, I'm very aware that some of those is a greater struggle for them to see. Um, and by them, I mean everybody. Um, not just our students, but all of us sometimes there's things that are like, why am I learning this? Um, but really helping see where that connection can be in our daily lives. And while the last year has been a struggle for everybody, there have been a lot of things in the last year that we can very directly connect with things in history. Um, and maybe some of that, at least for the next little bit, will be an opportunity for you to make those connections. This is not the first time we've had a global pandemic. It is the first time that we had Zoom to get through it. Um, but it's not the first time that we've dealt with um, civil rights issues. It's not the first time that we've had any of the things that are going on right now. It's just the first time that most of us have had them in our lifetime. Um, and so how are we helping people make that connection? And that might help, but that I, I think especially with survey classes, because it's so much information, is how do we help them find the thing that connects with them and motivates that extra step? I don't know if that oh, actually helped. But. No, oh, I, I completely agree because they, some students, if this really, some of this stuff has been an aha moment when I brought up the polio epidemic in the 50s and the 2020 class. I was like, you know, my mother didn't go out for an entire summer. She might catch polio. Mm -hmm. And the, the great influenza epidemic of World War I. And to see that there are patterns and this isn't totally, you're absolutely right there. But one thing that is a little confining is we do have departmental SLO. We have overarching things. And so there's only so much leeway you can have with trying to get them like what I used to do in my classes with more is let students pick their own term paper topic, something that interests them. You know, if they're a pharmacy major, something to do, you know, find something that sparks that in you. But it's being online only and having, you know, 30 people in class, that's just, that's just a disaster waiting to happen. That is just, that would be my own personal hell of having to run down all the potential plagiarized papers. But it is, I, I will say that this, the pandemic has offered an opportunity for a lot of those connections to be made. All of the events the last year, you're absolutely right. A oh, quick history fact, every time the Supreme, number of Supreme Court justices has changed, it has been in response to the sitting president to prevent him from making certain appointments. True history fact, I just found that out myself. Well, look y'all, we all just learned something new. Yay! <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, it goes all the way back to Thomas Jefferson in the very first court. Huh. Well, we are all going to do well at Jeopardy today, assuming that one question shows up. Otherwise, mm, <laughs> that, and I get it. Um, and I think some of it is, is too, is looking specifically at those student learning outcomes in relation to those course objectives. Um, because the course objectives are set by the department. Um, and if you're using an approved online course um, then that's a little bit different but even within that there's still some things that that you can kind of look at and as long as you don't lose the the meaning behind it there are some things that you can kind of look at and update and definitely talk to the developer about ways that y'all might be able to update it um, i think sometimes that comes back to two in in some general ed classes and in some um, early classes we go into it with the mindset of it's a lot of students and we need to get through it um, without overwhelming the faculty member, which I fully appreciate. Um, but sometimes that means that we rely more on things like um, a, a auto graded quiz or test um, to measure that, that learning and assessment. Um, but that's where 
we kind of can ask and have those conversations with the developer is, is, is that what we want them to be leaving with? Um, do we want them to have um, a specific memory of or remembering something, or do we want to know that they have enough knowledge of that that they can apply it later? And looking at those course level objectives and those um, student learning outcomes, and are we actually with that self graded test uh, or auto graded test, are we getting them to that objective or outcome that we stated? Um, are we using that because it's faster? Or are we using it because it's measuring what we want? Um, and that's a, I mean, that's a big, it's a big thing. Um, but that's just one of the things to think about with that. And those are some of the conversations that instructional designers have with developers is when we're, when we're working with you, if you want to do a bunch of, of auto graded quizzes, great. Let's look at your objectives and are those quizzes grading what you say that you want to be the thing. Um, and then looking at some other ways that we can help get assessments in there when it's a large enrollment group. Much more than 30, it gets hard in an online class. Um, so I know y'all know that, right? Choir, glad I could join y'all's choir. <laughs> what other questions do y'all have? And it's about time. So if anybody needs to go, um, please feel free. I know y'all have things to do. Um, so this was just to give an opportunity for y'all to ask questions and us to chat with you. So if you need to go, we won't worry, be worried about it. And thank y'all so much for coming today. It was, it was good to see everybody and good luck with the last week of your semester. I'm gonna stop our recording. Too.